So the ball thrown at 40 degree angle at 10 meters per second flies for two seconds, how far will it have gone? Okay, so first thing we're gonna go ahead and do is draw it out, be the 40 degree angle, 10 meters per second, we wanna find that vertical component. So now let's go ahead and figure, we get sine of 40 degrees equals the opposite divided by 10 meters per second. So we multiply both sides by 10, which gives us 10 times sine of 40 degrees equals the opposite, which equals our vertical initial velocity. So the initial vertical velocity times time, plus or minus the one half of our acceleration times t squared. Now the reason I say this is just gotta remember the context that we're working with. So in this one, you know, the gravity here, it's negative. So this is gonna be bringing us down. So we're gonna have v sub o. So, oh, nice. 6.43, thank you. So we got 6.43 times two seconds minus one half of 9.81 times two squared, which is gonna be four. And that's gonna equal our distance. So 6.43 times two is gonna give us 12.86 minus one half of 9.81 times four is gonna give us 19.62. So now it's 12.86 minus 19.62 is gonna give us a grand total of negative 6.8. Seven, six. Okay, cool. We will do another one where you're effectively kind of thinking of our acceleration as a positive number in just a few moments. But let's finish solving this guy out first. Okay, guys? So... Is that what you guys came up with? About uh, 6.76, negative. Awesome. All right, so let's go ahead and have a positive one. So you're in a car, okay, that, it, and if you guys want to figure out how far we're going horizontally, we're just gonna change this out for cosine, and then we don't have to worry about the acceleration from the way that we're currently setting things up. But on occasion, we are gonna to have to worry about acceleration. So, let's say you are in a car, and the car is initially going at, uh, we'll say five meters per second. You're gonna travel, uh, you're going to see something, and because of that, you're going to accelerate your car at about uh, three meters per second squared. Okay. How far will your car have gone in one minute? So, take, once again, x equals v sub o times t, in this case, it's going to be plus one half of our acceleration times t squared. All right, so we're going to have 5 times 60 plus 
one half of three times 60 squared and 60 squared should be 3,600. So we're going to end up with 300 plus 1.5 times 3600. So oh, 1.5 times 3600 is going to be a grand total of. Awesome. So Zach and I are in agreement. So looks good. 5,700 meters. AK in one minute, you would have literally gone more than, uh, yeah, we're talking about three odd miles. All right, how much force do you need to create to keep a block moving with a static friction of 0.9 and a dynamic of 0.8 if it weighs 4,500 newtons? Okay, so the first thing you guys need to think about is which of those two uh, frictions do we use? Do we use the static or do we use the dynamic? Bingo, dynamic, because it's moving. It is dynamic. So this one's actually really easy. So all we're gonna do, take force total we need equals our friction coefficient times our normal force. So coefficient of friction here is 0.8. Our normal force is 4,500. 0.8 times 4,500 equals our total force that we're gonna to need to produce. That's it, done. So that should be 3,600 minutes. Yeah, good job, Luke. That's it. Now we'll see who's paying attention to the wonderful uh, book reading we did earlier of my wonderful reference to uh, How To by Randall Monroe. What angle would we have to get that block on for it to naturally slide? What would be the angle we'd have to get it on to get it to slide? Now, you guys could use the dynamic friction, so that's what it needs to keep it sliding, or the static, and that's what's gonna to need to get it to slide. But we'll go with either. What angle do we need to go up to? Oh, so now we're just throwing out guesses, I like it. Okay. So the key is guys, remember the easiest way to go about this is literally just to go ahead and take the tangent of the angle. But the question is why? Why would we just wanna take the tangent of the angle?
we are, hmm, that's not a bad way to think about it. But remember, we have, we need both the vertical normal force and the horizontal force. So what we're literally doing, the reason, so if this is a flat surface, we take the tangent of this, well, technically it's going to be zero over one, so it's zero. If we go completely vertical, which obviously there's no chance of friction, it's gonna fall completely down because it's one over zero. Because effectively, tangent, okay, it's gonna equal the sine of that same angle over the cosine of the angle. And so why knowing that angle is gonna let us know where it's gonna shift at, which is as we go from that zero to that 90 degrees, we're going to start off with a, effectively a tangent of zero until and when we get to 45 degrees, it's gonna be equal to one. So anything with a coefficient of friction of one is gonna to start to slide when we get to 45 degrees. Anything above 45 degrees is a coefficient of over one. So that is something that really grips hard. It would be literally easier to pick up the object and move it than it is to try to slide it across the floor. So from here, what we're really looking for is at what angle is it naturally gonna to start to slide? So all we need is the inverse tangent of point nine is going to equal our angle. And then we have our solution for where it's gonna to start to slide. Now, let's, let's draw it out so it makes a little more sense, okay? We have the block sitting on an inclined plane. Its normal force brings it straight down, okay? That is actually your hypotenuse, is that in the previous example, the 4,500, there's your hypotenuse, okay? Now, what we're going to have is the normal force going directly into the surface and then the force pulling it down the plane. And what we're gonna see is if we're in a much slighter angle, okay, still have our force pulling straight down, but most of the force is gonna be going obviously straight and then only a little bit is gonna be pulling it down. Whereas when we have a real steep angle, we have the object, we have the actual major force vector, most of the force is gonna be dragging it straight down and only a little bit is gonna be pulling it in. So hence, the angle that we're gonna be pulling it at. And then the angle, same thing over here, that we're gonna be working with. What are the questions you guys want to work your way through? All right, guys. So remember, when it comes to the coefficient of restitution, we're looking at effectively how much of that initial bounce is going to be recovered. Now, this is one that's literally meant to be insane. It just doesn't work like that, where the coefficient of restitution is typically going to be less than one. So what we're really looking at is each bounce is going to return however much height that restitution is. So typically, think of it as a percentage. So this is saying 160%, but it's like people that say give 110%, which is mathematically impossible, hence it's stupid. Okay, so.
first bounce, ball gets dropped, falls 10 meters, and then it's gonna bounce 1.6 times its initial bounce, it's actually gonna come up all the way to 16 meters. Then it's gonna go back down, bounce again, and it's gonna go even higher, another 1.6 on top of that initial 16. So literally we're just gonna take 10 times 1.6, and then take that answer and multiply it again by 1.6. So 16 times 1.6 is going to be 16.6 plus 3.6 on going. So it's going to be about 25.66 or so. 25.26, I'll take that. That sounds right. Look, I'm not using a calculator. I'm doing this stuff in my head. There's a chance that I could be wrong. So it is 25.6. So I beat the machine. Cool. What are the questions would you guys like to work through? Yes, we're going to discuss torque once we go into our next chapters, but we're not there yet. All torque is effectively is Newton meters. So it's force, only now it's force against a lever. So it's something when we're doing rotation. So an easy example of producing torque would be, honestly, is things like lifting weights because whenever we lift a weight, we're rotating about an axis, and that axis is going to be going, and the biceps attaching into the, the ulna is what's lifting the arm up and allowing the arm to go down. So in order to produce torque, it's the Newton meters going around that elbow joint. So if I had a heavy weight in my hand, that is producing torque trying to lower my arm, but me obviously using strength, uh, uh, biceps, brachioradialis, and uh, brachialis is what's going to allow me to lift that object. Um, and that obviously is going to require a certain amount of force production. Awesome. Okay. So how much force would you need to produce to push a hundred kilogram block that has a coefficient of friction of 0.9? Now, the first thing we need to do is convert the weight of that block into a force. So since we effectively only have a mass of it, what do we need to do? Bingo, multiply by gravity. So, the normal force, because we're on a flat plane in this example, okay, is gonna be equal to 100 kilograms multiplied by 9.81 meters per second squared acceleration. equals force. Now this is going to then be multiplied by that coefficient of friction. So we're going to have effectively the force we need to overcome. So we're going to have 981 times 0.9. And that's going to equal the total amount of force we're going to have to use, which Luke's coming up with 882.9, and that looks right. Everybody else in agreement with Luke? Awesome. Mark 
Parker again is not doing a great job. So what else do you guys want to talk your way through? Could you go over lever arms again? Yeah, no worries. Give me one second, guys. We're going to do it. Let's just do it. You're just so excited. You just want to move ahead. Okay. So you guys have had a couple of questions about chapter four, so let's just let's just start on it. Let's just get into it. So, okay, unless you guys have got other review questions as we go through, then let me know and I'll stop and we'll talk about that. But really, all we're doing with chapter four is taking everything that we've done before with linear, and now we're making it rotational. So angular motion is just rotating about an axis. So obviously, the faster you rotate in degrees per second, the faster you happen to be going. So meaning if we're talking about something slow, so we're talking about like lifting the arm up and something like, you know, 10 degrees per second, if we go real fast, now we're talking about getting ourselves closer to 180 degrees per second and even faster if we're talking about things like pitching. Now torque itself is the rotation effect of that force out an axis, okay? Now this is gonna be equal to the amount of force we're producing and then the distance that forces from the actual point of rotation, so the axis. Okay, and then notice guys, it's a perpendicular force. So an easy example of it is for any of you guys that have ever used a wrench, the longer the handle is, even if I'm applying the same amount of force with my hand, since I've got the longer lever arm, it's going to increase the amount of force we're producing. And torque is always going to be created in the perpendicular action. So the moment arm, if we're pulling or pushing in an angle, it's just gonna be the distance always from the actual center of rotation. And this comes in whenever we happen to be moving other objects. And then also when we happen to have some of our muscles contracting about our joints. So all we're really looking at is the equal or the amount of force we're producing and the distance from that axis, okay? That gives us torque. Torque is in, Capital N Newtons, meters, lowercase m, Newton meters, okay? It's always gonna be perpendicular from that axis and we can obviously change our torque by increasing our force or increasing the length of the moment arm. Now, levers is what Zach brought up. Now, we've got three different classifications of levers. First class lever is going to be where the force we're producing is going to be on one end the fulcrum, so the point of which we happen to be moving is in the center, and then the resistance is on the opposite side. So a great example of this is a seesaw. We then have a second class lever. This is gonna be where we're gonna have the fulcrum on one end, and the force we're producing on the other, and the resistance is gonna be in the center. Now, a great example of this is a wheelbarrow, if any of you guys have ever used one. Then our final option, which is the way that most of the muscles in the body actually work, which is gonna be what's known as a third class lever, where you have the fulcrum again on one side, but then we have the resistance on the other side and we have the force we're producing somewhere in the middle. So, you know, getting back to the bicep example, our fulcrum is on the one end, our resistance is gonna be on the other end, and then in between and actually not too far from the actual joint is gonna be where our biceps actually attaches to our ulna, and that's what's gonna be lifting it up. Now, it gives you an advantage when it comes to speed, but it gives you a massive disadvantage when it comes to force production, as in maximal strength. Now, 
A lever is simply going to be a rigid bar that allows us to transmit the force from one side to the other, okay? This is gonna be used to balance forces, can be set in a situation where it favors force production like that second class lever with a wheelbarrow. It can be favoring the speed and range of motion like it is with a third class. And it obviously is gonna help us change the direction of how our force is being applied. So remember, we have our fulcrum. We have our effort. Okay, so it's the force arm where we're lifting from. And then we have our resistance. That's what we're trying to overcome. That's what's pulling us down, okay? We've got effectively just three basic ways you can organize this, and hence why you only have three different classes of levers. Now, where that fulcrum, effort, or resistance is between the two in the first, third, and second class levers, uh, respectively, is going to be dependent on, obviously, how that joint happens to be set up or whatever you're working with or looking at is performing. So our bones are our levers, the joints are our fulcrums, and our contracting muscles happen to be that effort arm, that force arm, okay? Now they're obviously not always gonna be perfect examples of bars, as is evidenced by a number of special bones we have, and where we're gonna have the resistance can be obviously pretty difficult to perfectly define. And we have a lot of other things building in the resistance in that we have the weight of the limb, so the center of mass of the forearm and the hand is also being lifted along with whatever weight is in your hand. We have antagonistic muscles. So when the biceps contract, you get a little bit of resistance from the tricep on the other side. And then we have fascia, which is going to be effectively connective tissue, which is gonna give us some resistance to movement. And it's even more prevalent um, for those of you guys that have ever uh, taken yoga with me otherwise, you actually have felt to that point of which your fascia will not allow you to move any further. It's not necessarily a limitation of your muscles, as in, you know, you weren't really feeling a stretch too heavily on any of your tissues, but you could actually feel how your connective tissues wouldn't allow you to move any further. So specifically for um, Zach and Caitlin, can you guys think of a good example of a pose where you can definitely feel that? Plow pose. Yeah, I was gonna say the same thing for me. We're just laying back. It's not that hard of a stretch, but for the life of me, getting my toes to touch the ground just doesn't really happen. And since Caitlin's not saying anything, we all know that she's just one of those folks that just logged in and then you know walked away so that no one would notice, but now we've all noticed that she's not here. So all we're looking for for holding an object in position, so me keeping this marker at the same angle in my elbow, is going to simply be the effort, it's how much force the bicep's lifting with, multiplied by the effort arm, it's distance from the fulcrum, equals the resistance. Now, the resistance is the weight of the marker, weight of my hand, weight of my forearm, and then where the distance is for the center of mass of all those happen to be. So, in a perfect world, if you really wanted to break this down, the easy way is just, we're only looking at the bicep, but really we've got the bicep, we've got the brachialis, and we've got the brachioradialis. All of those are producing their own amount of effort and have their own effort arms. This is what you guys will be doing in your projects. Now, for the resistance, we've got not just the weight of the marker, we've got the weight of my hand, which is way heavier than the marker, and the weight of my forearm, which is even heavier than my hand, and then I've got my wedding ring on and I've got a bracelet on. And all of those are going to be adding a little bit more load. So it's the sum of all of the resistance, times the resistance arms on one side, and the sum of all those effort times the other. Oh, Caitlin is there, good. And what, you still haven't told us what, uh, what pose in yoga, you, would, you could just feel limitations when you're doing it. You're still leaving us hanging. The other fun one was watching uh, Zach and a lot of the other guys that are kind of bound up like me trying to do a bridge. The impossible. It's not impossible. It's just, it's just very difficult. And plus, I think I know what we need to work on in, uh, in training now. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Okay. So do you guys, when we say we're looking for the point of which we have the shortest axis, the easiest way for you guys to kind of figure this out is I want you to go ahead 
and on a table, bed, or anything you want, push down or get a family member to push down as hard as they can on your arm and then realize, oh, there you go, Caitlin. So you can feel that in your ankles. You have that limitation. Um, maybe not necessarily due to gastroc or soleus tightness. And you can, you can hold a significant amount of weight as long as you have that perpendicular because the resistance, me pushing down, is always gonna be equal to the perpendicular line of the force. And since it's super close to the elbow, you can hold that weight all day. But if instead we have your hand almost flattened out and someone pushing down on the far side, it doesn't require near as much force for them to actually get you to go ahead and bend that elbow, okay? And the key is we're still applying the same amount of force down. We just don't have that same distance of that resistance arm when we're looking at the perpendicular force production. Does that make sense to you guys? Ooh, uh, even easier one for you guys that are at home. Go and get on the ground and get in a push-up position with your hands straight down in front of you, okay? So that's the force that you have to overcome, okay? It's the same force that you have to overcome when you keep your arms straight, but you put your arms out in a nice wide fly. Now, see if you can hold that position with your arms nice and long out to the sides. You might not be able to hold that simply because what we've done is we've increased the length of that resistance arm and the effort arm because we're now in that more spread position than, they were, than we were previously. So, a good example of a first class lever is literally going to be your head. So specifically, most of the mass of your head is in front of the axis, which is, or the axis in the atlas, which is literally the axis of which the head rotates. So this mass is constantly trying to drop our head down. Now on the backside, our spinal erectors are what's contracting to go ahead and hold us up. So. Therein lies an easy example of that first class lever in the human body. So, another first class lever is the tricep getting, so tricep right behind the axis here, and that's going to be lifting the resistance that's going through the front of the arm. Scissors are another example of a first class lever. And so while we're on this slide, when it comes to first class levers, guys, if we want to have a little bit more ease or shall we say strength when trying to cut like a you know, thick stack of papers or something along those lines, where would we put those papers relative uh, to like the end, like the very tips of the scissors or all the way really close to the uh, axis that they rotate at? Where would we have it set? Yes, why would we do that, Corey? Bingo, leverage because now we happen to have nowhere near as long of a resistance arm. So if we can only produce a finite amount of force and we have a fixed force arm, the way that we can increase the res essentially the amount of force the resistance is having to deal with is by shortening that resistance arm. So, so when we say the four functions, balance of two or more, so AKA just keeping yourself in a fixed position, favor force production. So that's gonna be like using a shovel and that the axis of the shovel is going to be the blade on the ground, your resist or your force and force arm is really long compared to the blade of the shovel at the end. Favor speed and range of motion, that's going to be, you know, an ex example of that would be having something where you're actually maybe like, no, not necessarily chopsticks. Because that wouldn't be how you'd try to use that whatsoever if you're doing it right. Um, 
but effectively giving yourself a greater amount of length for the, uh, for the resistance side. And then change direction exactly when you think about that seesaw. You push down on one side, it lifts up on the other. So second class lever, this is something that really helps with force production. So we've got using a wheelbarrow as a great example of it. The only other like good example of this in the human body happens to be whenever you push down into the ground up onto the balls of your feet because we are gonna be lifting ourselves through our calcaneus tendon, aka our Achilles heel. So it's gonna be the very back of the foot our fulcrum or axis is gonna be the ball of the foot and the resistance that we're overcoming is the weight of the body and whatever objects you're holding that happens to be going through the ankle. So as we contract, we're going to be lifting ourselves up and that's gonna allow us to produce the force to lift that body through the center of the axis, or sorry, the center of mass that's gonna be going through the ankle. And this is part of my own personal argument why calves can be small because they don't need to be very big to be very strong simply because they actually are leveraged in a way that they have an advantage. So the same class lever, your effort arm is always longer than the resistance arm. Now, we're then gonna have our third class levers. Now this could be using things like tongs, this can be using uh, things, well, they have the example of a broom, but I think one of the easier ones to think about is like a fishing pole, where if any of you guys have ever gone fishing before, and if you have, like, go ahead and put in there, like, what's the biggest fish you ever caught? Where when you're reeling in a fish, it feels pretty darn heavy because the axis is gonna be the bottom of the pole, the effort is where you're lifting from, and then all the way at the end of the pole, that's the resistance pulling you down. So even if you're catching something like a yeah, 10, 20 pound catfish, those fish are gonna feel very heavy at the end of a fishing pole because of the length of that resistance arm that you're having to overcome. So the advantages of a third class lever is you get a lot of speed. So when you think about when you're casting that line, you can throw your lure out a massive distance because you got at the end of that pole. Think about the sport of lacrosse. When you have that stick, that's gonna magnify the force or the essentially the velocity because the key is, you know, velocity, remember guys, when we're talking about rotation, it's degrees per second. But what happens is as we increase the length of lever arm, well, yeah, it's only moving 30 degrees per second. But if we're going at 30 degrees per second, just an inch off, well, we also still have a horizontal velocity that that's being produced, which is nowhere near as big as if we have it at the end of a two meter pole, where 30 degrees is gonna cover a much greater distance in that same period of time. So we're naturally gonna to produce torque all throughout the body. That's how we're moving and it's gonna be causing rotation about the joints. And I love this picture because this was an old school way to do hamstring curls, which, you know, teach their own. But we're gonna talk about also how some of these things are kind of dumb. I really in, in would enjoy watching the people do like putting the dumbbell between their toes when they're doing uh, leg curls and thinking that's, that's a difficult ex exercise for some reason. Um, because the force they're actually having to produce, which is a major, it's a, it's a moderate factor in actually building muscle size is actually not gonna be that great. So remember guys, if we're not moving, our effort times our effort arm is gonna be equal to our resistance time or resistance arm. If the resistance time resistance arm is greater, we're gonna be lowering. If it is less, we are going to be lifting. So depending on where that fulcrum is at and that first class lever, notice when we apply a little bit of force down, we're gonna cover a much greater distance on the resistance side. And obviously vice versa, if we put the fulcrum closer to the resistance arm. Now, 
Eccentric force is what we call it whenever the direction of the force is not perfectly in line with the object center of gravity. So this means not just are we going to have translation, translatory motion, aka pushing something perhaps back, but we're also going to have a rotational force. And what's going to happen is this force is going to cause that object to start to rotate or at least try to rotate. So some simple examples here, but think about sport, okay, of how we're going to be creating examples of eccentric force. So an easy way for you guys to feel the effects of an eccentric force in the body would be for you to get in a plank position and then take one of those hands off the ground. From there, you're going to immediately feel your body wanting to rotate because of the lack of stability and now you're having a greater amount of force put on one side or the other. Now, I do have some links over there that you got at the bottom. You can kind of see that, but those are up on your slides online that you guys can look up. That's going to give you some examples of eccentric force and how we're going to create that about the axis of rotation of which we're trying to well, rotate it upon. Now, all of your torques, that's why we've had it as the effort times effort arm equals resistance times resistance arm. It is the summation of all of them. So we have all of these forces acting together, both pulling an object down and lifting it up, and that's going to give us its overall effect on motion. So we're going to, throughout the body, do a great amount of what's referred to as force coupling, which is where we have a number of forces working in parallel that are going to give us a greater amount of force production. So an example is when you turn your torso, you have your internal oblique on the side you're turning towards and your external oblique on the opposite side contracting and that's what's going to give us force coupling to give us that rotation even more so than if we just had one or the other. The muscles of the scapula when it's going to allow the shoulder to go ahead and rotate is going to have the same basic idea of the fibers of the upper trap, the lower trap and the serratus anterior are going to all work together to give us upward rotation at the scapula itself. Now we're going to see this force coupling going all the way through kinetic chain. When you think about something like throwing a baseball and that we're using the force of, and the power rotation being developed in the lower body, which is going to be translated through the core and added to, which is then going to be translated through the arm and give us the greatest amount of velocity on that pitch when the athlete does a really good job of timing up all these motions together. So, all of our torques is, are gonna be added up together and that's gonna give us the total force that we're seeing in the system, okay? Now, each of these are gonna have both a magnitude and a direction. So, what we're typically gonna to consider to be movement clockwise is gonna be negative and counterclockwise is gonna be positive. Don't worry about this one too much for your guys' both homework and then your exams. Instead, you're gonna be giving the torques in the different directions. It's just important that you're gonna be able to derive what's really occurring. But keep in mind, torque is always in newtons times meters. So you have to make sure that you're using your appropriate units because that's one of the easiest things to make a mistake with. So here is an example where you can see the summation of torques of a number of different weights at different distances from the fulcrum. So notice between our first force of A, which is gonna be on the left, and notice that's gonna be giving us a rotation that's going clockwise because it's lifting it up, so it's gonna be turning it in that direction, it is gonna be equals to five newtons times the 1.5 meters that it happens to be the distance of. Then we have the negative also torque from B because that's pulling it down on the right side of the fulcrum, and that's gonna be three meters multiplied by 10 newtons. So we're gonna sum those two together and then from there, we're going to then add, so we've had negative terms so far, the C torque, which is going to be three meters also from the axis, but only five newtons, and that's positive because it's trying to turn it counterclockwise. And so that's gonna give us a total of negative 22.5 newton, newton meters. So, the further we are from that actual fulcrum, guys, the greater the velocity is going to be. So the key is, no matter where we're at along this line, let's say, for example, it's just going to be rotating at 10 degrees per second. Well, 
10 degrees per second, if this is at one meters and this is at two meters, we're going to see that the actual velocity of it going from B to B prime effectively is going to be only about half the velocity that's gonna occur at C to C prime. So this is where I think of like, a, you can think of like a saw blade, you can think of like a carousel, you can think of a lot of different examples of things that are rotating at relative, at fast enough speeds, but if you look at the center of the axis, it's actually moving relatively slow. But when you look at the very end that it's actually spinning about, it's going very, very rapidly. So obviously, depending on what we're going to be doing, we are going to be selecting different levers that's going to allow us to you know, do whatever skill we're trying to effectively perform. And we're always trying to look for the most efficient way to do it. Now, what's fascinating is if we have an individual who's spinning and we're trying to spin as fast as possible, the further out we put resistance from the center of ourselves, and that's thanks to the preservation of rotational inertia, which we're gonna to touch on in a bit, we're going to see that the closer, the tighter we keep ourselves, the faster we're gonna be able to spin, the more open and wide we're gonna put our body position in, the slower our rotation is going to be. So, the reason we're going to pick certain lever arms is a shorter lever arm, a tighter position, is going to allow us to have a faster angular velocity, but we're not gonna be moving as quickly, okay? And whereas if we're trying to produce as much strength as, we're, as is possible, we typically want to shorten our range of motion up as much as possible, and from there, be able to not have as great a force we have to overcome. So that's getting back to that wonderful plank example I had you guys do earlier of trying to think about keeping your arms in narrow as opposed to putting them out wide for a push-up. You're going to have to produce a greater amount of force through your pecs effectively with your arms wide as opposed to with your arms in narrow. And then have any of you guys ever tried to do what's known as a zerker squat? They're miserable. So, oh, well, Zach, we'll have to introduce you to it because they're horrible, but they're useful. Huh. So what you're, with a Zerker squat, you're gonna hold the barbell in the crook of your elbows. And then from there, obviously, you're gonna be performing a squat. Now, the key is when you're doing a Zerker squat and you're obviously lifting it from the crook of your elbows, you can hold a couple hundred pounds, nearly any of you guys, it's gonna be uncomfortable, but you can easily hold 200 plus pounds, someone that might not even be able to curl 40 or 50 pound dumbbells. The reason for it is because the length of that lever arm is so short because it's just right off the arm or right off the axis. So your normal, typical massive lever disadvantage that you do when you're lifting something with elbow flexion is no longer that big of an issue because now it's gonna be right off that center mass. And yeah, they're, they're horrible. Huh. Yeah, we might have to do that on Thursday. So when we're trying to figure out how much of a mechanical advantage or disadvantage that we're gonna have with a lever, we're literally going to come up with a very simple formula, which is simply the mechanical advantage is gonna equal the resistance arm over the effort arm. So if we happen to have a really short effort arm and a long resistance arm, we're going to have very, very bad, or sorry, the mechanical advantage is the resistance over the effort. So if we've got to produce a lot of effort just to overcome that resistance, like we do with the bicep, we've got really bad mechanical advantage. Because all we're doing is taking the balanced lever equation of resistance times resistance arm equals effort times the effort arm, and then dividing both sides by the effort, dividing each side by the resistance arm, and that gives you the final equation of resistance divided by effort equals effort arm over resistance arm. So in a perfect world, you wanna find a mechanical leverage or mechanical advantage that's obviously over one, because that's showing that whenever you're producing force on the effort arm, you don't have to produce near as much to overcome whatever's on the other side of the resistance arm. But once again, in the human body, this pretty much really never occurs. So, 
for your guys' projects when we're thinking about this in general. You need to always think is, where is our fulcrum? Where are we producing our effort from? And where is our resistance? What angle is the effort applied to the lever? Okay, because remember we're looking for that perpendicular force production. We're not looking at the exact point of insertion. Same thing with our resistance. And what is the actual effort arm of the lever? What's the resistance arm of the lever? What are the relative lengths of the two compared to one another? So we're kind of looking at the mechanical advantage. What kind of movement does this favor? Is, what's the mechanical advantage, disadvantage? And what class of lever are we actually working with? So we have the wonderful rotational physics that are just going to be modifications of the linear physics you've seen before. So body continues its state of rest or uniform rotation unless it's acted on. So objects in motion stay in motion unless acted upon, meaning things are going to rotate unless something is trying to stop them from rotating. Okay? Acceleration of rotating body is directly proportional to the torque causing it, so the greater amount of torque, greater amount of rotation, and whatever amount of torque you're producing, an inverse proportional amount of moment of inertia is occurring on the body. And then finally, when one torque is applied to another, the second will always exert an equal and opposite torque on the first. So whatever force you're producing, or torque you're producing, that torque is coming back through you. So we had linear inertia, now we have the moment of inertia. Okay, and this is going to be the inertia of rotation. So how much is something trying to resist it being rotated? Now this is thanks to both the mass of the object and the distance the mass is distributed from the axis of its rotation, okay? So what can you guys think of that would have naturally a really low moment of inertia? I mean, it's really easy to spin. It's really easy to spin. Merry-go-round. Do you think that's going to be easy to spin or hard to spin? A globe, potentially. How many of you guys ever try to spin a basketball? How many of you guys ever try to spin like an old school little top? How many of you guys have ever tried to spin one of those fidget spinners? So that would be an example of something where, especially the fidget spinner, doesn't have a lot of mass, and the distance that the mass is going to be rotating from the axis is not very far. Now, the merry-go-round that Zach threw out there, especially when it's unloaded, it's going to give you more resistance, obviously, than the fidget spinner. But then if we start loading a bunch of kids on there, because now we've increased the mass, we're going to be rotating even faster, or it's going to take even more force to get it to rotate about that axis. So really what we're trying to figure out is the point of which we're going to rotate where we have the balance of the mass times the radius from that axis. Okay, so everything's going to have a natural point where it's trying to rotate from. Okay, it's that center of mass. So Caitlin, because I know you're there, you just might not want to unmute yourself and that's fine. But when you were obviously cheering and people are doing back tucks, where do you see them? Like if you actually watch them from the side, where's their body rotating from? Are they rotating around their head? Are they rotating around their feet? Where are they really rotating around? Are they rotating about their head? It's usually gonna be more about through their hip and through effectively through their waist. If you watch them from the side, that's gonna be that axis of rotation. If somebody had a head that was that massive that they're rotating around it, that's probably not a good or a safe thing. We should probably get that looked at. So just think about when you see an object rotate. And so you throw a football and it spirals. Like it's rotating effectively through its center, like the very center of the ball. 
And if you throw a spiral poorly, you'll see it kind of wobbling a little bit as it goes through the air, but it still has that center axis. Like if you're literally watching it, you'd see that point. Now, obviously things like a baseball, softball, basketball, the center of the axis is the dead center of the object. Now through a baseball bat, depending on if we have a weight at the end of the handle or not, that axis of rotation is gonna be way closer to the barrel than it is gonna to be towards the handle. Because notice the inertia equals the sum, that's what sigma stands for, the mass times the radius squared. So hence, the mass matters, but technically the radius, so the distance from the center of axis is even more important. Now, we then have what's known as the radius of gyration, okay? Now, this is the distance from the axis of rotation, the point of where the body mass could be concentrated. So where we're going to see the overall mass of it, okay? This gives us an idea for the inertia that we have to overcome to get that to move. So the inertia equals the mass, times the radius squared. And the radius here is gonna be represented by the letter K. So if we're talking about running, when your leg is in a longer position, so you're in a straighter position, you've got a greater amount of inertia. That's why typically when you sprint, you lift your leg up and through, but you also bend your knee because this is going to sh make your radius of gyration smaller so you don't have as great of inertia you have to overcome in order to lift your leg up and bring it back in front of you when you're trying to, once again, sprint at top speed. Now, angular momentum is fascinating because it's going to be preserved and it's gonna be something you're going to observe with athletes all the time in sport. And what it, all it equals to is your inertia multiplied by your rotational velocity. Rotational velocity is what looks like kind of a funky W. It's a lower case omega. Okay, so angular momentum is going to be equal to our inertia, which remember is mass times our radius squared multiplied by our angular velocity. And we are going to preserve it, meaning just like we had the person pushing the cart, we're first running and then they hit the cart and they're all gonna to push together. We're gonna to find the same thing with angular momentum, where if we have our initial rotational velocity, we are going to maintain that total amount of angular momentum when we then look at both the mass and then our radius squared from our final angular momentum. So, and this is once again, not really fair because Caitlin's lived this a lot um, and a lot of you guys haven't. But when it comes to angular momentum, and so think of it this way, Caitlin, what can you do as far as the radius of your body to help yourself rotate faster when you're doing a back tuck, meaning a standing back flip? It's okay, Caitlin. When you're doing a standing back tuck, what can you do as far as your body's radius to allow yourself to rotate faster? You can unmute yourself, yeah. Tuck yourself in general, yeah, tuck your legs and try to get yourself into a tighter ball. So what's the thing that a lot of people screw up with when they're first learning how to do a tuck that effectively, they have the same angular momentum, but now their angular velocity becomes much slower. What do they do? Are you talking about like if they let their legs out too early? Bingo, when they kick out early. So by kicking out early, so if you're, if you're imagining someone doing a standing backflip, guys, and then they all of a sudden they go from they're in a tight ball and then they're in this open position. And some folks will do an open position where it's like right on their face. The problem is, is you have the same angular momentum, but you go from having a relatively small radius to a really wide radius. Notice that it's radius squared. So the second you kick out, you kill your rotation because your mass stays the same. I mean, unless you're somehow vomiting or, you know, 
losing weight from another orifice of your body while you're doing a standing backflip, which just sounds absolutely horrible to be in the gym with that person, your mass is going to stay the same. So the only thing that you can really control to enhance, to both increase the speed or decrease the speed of your angular rotation is going to be your radius. So how tight of a tuck we're in or how open of a position we're in. So hence the second you open, that's when you kill your rotation. Because, and now Caitlin, when you had individuals throwing a basket where you then throw them up with partners as high as possible in the air, they're going to be able to potentially over rotate. So go beyond doing just one backflip. And because of this, they can obviously risk having a lot of injuries. So they need to think about opening themselves up in order to kill that angular rotation. And so you guys can go ahead and look up examples of this online or Caitlin can go ahead and tell you happy stories about doing baskets because everybody loves both throwing and catching baskets, don't they, Caitlin? Oh, totally. I love getting hit in the face. Notice her statement about the getting lit, hit in the face. So when you see Caitlin next time in person, feel free to ask her about her nose. Or, or is that unfair? So, does this make sense, guys? Talking about the preservation of angular momentum and how it's important. Because notice, guys, our initial angular momentum is going to equal our final angular momentum. The key thing we can really control is going to be the radius that we happen to be at. All right. So here's an example of someone doing a forward dive into a pool that as they tuck themselves tighter into the ball, they're gonna be able to rotate a lot faster. Um, if you guys really wanna see great examples of people in a really, really tight ball to rotate at high speeds, please look up uh, Olympic diving, specifically like platform diving. The, the speed of rotation those people are able to attain by staying in such a tight tucked position is truly awesome to behold. So, how do we get angular momentum? Well, our angular momentum, meaning our angular impulse, how this is gonna change, is going to equal our torque multiplied by the time of which we were able to produce it, okay? So hence, by producing that initial torque, so that's literally part of the jump and set and being aggressive coming off the ground with both the arms and the legs, that's going to give us that initial angular momentum. Now, so we're going from having zero to whatever. Now from there, as we tuck tighter in the ball after we've jumped off the ground, we're going to be able to tuck at a greater velocity because we are in that tightened position. So we're not going to have as great of a resistance thanks to having a greater inertia to rotation. So that's why when you see people do uh, flips, you see them first initially start in a big open position and aggressively start that rotation. From there, they're going to tuck into that tighter ball, so they're going to be able to rotate even faster because they had that initial momentum or angular impulse. Now they're going to maintain that angular momentum, but get it at a greater velocity because of having a shorter lever. So. Hence why when you see people doing a back tuck or otherwise, they're gonna typically jump backwards a little bit because they're starting that initial impulse of going backwards. And the same thing is gonna be true whenever people are, being, are trying to do a forward tuck. So when we're thinking about the difference between linear physics and rotational physics, well, here's your basic breakdown. Oh, instead of having mass, now we have moment of inertia. So it's not just mass, but now we're going to multiply that by our radius squared. Where instead of force, we have torque. And all we're going to do is take force multiplied by the distance from the axis that we're going to find that perpendicular force production. Okay. We then have momentum, which equals mass times velocity. And your momentum is mass times radius squared times rotational velocity. And our impulse, instead of being force multiplied, change of force multiplied by the change in time, we now have the angular impulse, which is going to be our force multiplied by the distance for the perpendicular force production from the radius multiplied by time. 
So we will go ahead and stop it here because I know I've been covering a solid amount of information, but any other questions, comments, concerns before we call it a day today, guys? No, no questions? Awesome. Well, everybody, have yourselves a great day. Take care of yourselves. And I will see you guys back online on Thursday. And I guess we will review if you guys have any questions. Otherwise, we'll just go ahead and do some more lecturing. And you guys are going to be in charge of taking that exam sooner rather than later. Stay safe out there, guys. Talk to you more soon. Bye-bye.